Um, I, I guess I'll say a, a few words about uh, the center and who's involved first before I get into my talk. Um, the, the center was kind of born out of conversations with uh, the dean and the president over the past few years. And, and the, Augustana is a bit unique in that we have people currently on the faculty doing research at both poles. Um, myself, initially in, in Antarctica, and now Allison Beck is, is getting involved in my project, and then uh, Dr. Jennifer Burnham, uh, who's working in Greenland with her husband, uh, Dr. Kurt Burnham. And, and so that was kind of an unusual thing for a college like this. Uh, but even more so, it was very unusual that besides what we were doing here, we had a lot of connections with other polar researchers in other places. So we got this idea together to put this, this center together, and, and, and we're, we're in the formative stages, but we, what we want to do is promote what's going on now and use that to bring more students a, in, into polar research and polar studies and, in, and, to, and connect our students and our faculty with people doing polar research in other places. Uh, initially, I have students have done well, th this is a natural spin-off because I've had students working with me on my polar research project for years. All current uh, Augustana students have been involved with me for over 20 years. Sometimes they're current students, sometimes they're students who were here and have gone on to graduate school and they're still connected with me. Uh, I know Jenny, she hasn't been here that long, but she and Kurt have students working with them in Greenland on research projects. So this is a, sort of a natural evolution of what's going on here and a way to promote it, get more students involved. Uh, but we also have some other ideas. Uh, we're going to sponsor, initially for example, we're going to sponsor a four lecture series here starting in January. This is the, the first event other than this of, of the center, uh, but it, it's an event that's meant not only to highlight polar studies, but in conjunction to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the college. So we brought in two people doing Antarctic research, two doing Arctic research, We've got somebody doing geophysics, looking for neutrinos, outer space particles by drilling 5,000 feet into the ice at the South Pole, weird. Um, we, we have somebody doing archaeology in Greenland. Uh, we've got somebody doing hydrology related to climate studies in the Arctic. And then finally, somebody that works on uh, fossil plants from Antarctica and talks more about um, what the vegetation was like. It, it, collaborative person with me, I talk about the animals. So this is a way to sort of introduce polar studies to the campus and the community at large. These are going to be public lectures and again sponsor over the next, uh, up from now until the end of spring term. In the future though, we, we, we plan, uh, no definite plans, but probably symposia, sometimes a meeting, sometimes here, more lectures, uh, but particularly we want to get students interested in this connected with people, uh, ourselves and people in other institutions. Uh, we have a board made up of eight people. Four of us are at Augustana. The, 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 the Burnhams that I talked about myself and Allison Beck who's working with me, but we have four other people not from Augustana doing polar research, three of whom have former Augustana connections. Anders Carlson, who does Arctic research. He's on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, or uh, Madison. He got his start here, working with uh, Jeff Strasser. Uh, Nathan Smith, who's worked with me, and is at the University of Chicago, and uh, uh, working on, on vertebrates. Uh, Jim Collinson, who's an emeritus faculty from Ohio State, uh, who's the reason I'm here, and I'll say a little bit more about that when I get into the slides. He's talking into applying for this job. And, and, then, and then Edith Taylor, who's a, the paleobotanist giving the talk. So we have a variety of people that we have connections with, and, and we're hoping to get our students not only involved in research here, but we're, we're hoping to plan academic programs not just related to research. Maybe, some, maybe a summer course in Greenland. Uh, I've talked with Kim Tuncliffe about a focused foreign term where we take students to the Antarctic Peninsula for two or three weeks. Students that aren't necessarily interested in doing the Antarctic research, but are interested in the Antarctic issues. So that's kind of uh, what our plans are and why we got this thing going in the first place. Okay, so uh, with that, I will start the 
the topic of tonight, which is kind of what some of you may have, uh, particularly my students here, I see some of them in the back, oh, who, uh, as Amanda asked me um, when she was coming in if I was going to do my usual dog and pony show, um, which is what I call it when I do things for the not dinosaurs for the public. And it's not quite that, it's a little derivation of that, because I'm going to throw in a little bit of history, uh, history of my involvement in Antarctic work, and history of Antarctic work and what I do in general, and, and talk about some things other than dinosaurs. Because now we have not only dinosaurs from Antarctica, as the title tells you, we have giant amphibians as dinosaurs. And most people are unaware of some of these other interesting animals we find in Antarctica. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that and how this has all evolved. Now, you have to understand, one thing about paleontology in general, it's compared to a lot of sciences, it's, it's fairly young. Uh, I mean, we had people, Galileo, way back studying the stars and the solar systems, before people even recognized that fossils represented the evidence of past life. It wasn't really until the beginning of the 19th century that people started to accept fossils as evidence of things that aren't here anymore. And so we haven't really studied fossils for that long. So even so though, it was in 1842, finally when we started to have some realization of fossils, that someone finally, Sir Richard Owen, coined the term dinosaurium for three fossil species in 1842. We got him here on a bad day, he doesn't have his teeth in, but he's the first curator of paleontology at the British Museum of Natural History. 1842, he coined the term dinosaurium. Between 1842 and the beginning of the 20th century, people started finding fossils and describing fossils from all over the world. But we didn't have any fossils from Antarctica. In fact, in 1842, when he coined that term, that was only 20 years after the first person had sighted the continent of Antarctica. The Greeks predicted it existed way back when, just to balance the masses in the north. But it wasn't until the 1820s that someone actually finally saw the continent and proved it was there. Otherwise, you know, we would have named, never named Australia Australia. Australia, I don't know if you know Latin, Austral means southern. Well, it isn't the southern continent. It's almost the southern continent. So it isn't surprising that we didn't find fossils in Antarctica for so long because nobody even knew it was there. But even so, once we discovered Antarctica was there, it wasn't until the early part of the 20th century that we did any exploration of it. And it wasn't until 1958, 50 years ago, that there was any permanent research basis established on the continent to support scientific research. So it's a relatively young place where you've been doing science. Well, the reasons for that are obvious. Once we found it, it was still a hard place to get to because um, you'll notice, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Antarctica, uh, this, is, this is Antarctica, this is the continental U.S. superimposed on it. So for surface area, you can see that it's larger than the continental United States. If you added Mexico on to the U.S., that would be about equal to the area of Antarctica. So it's a pretty big place. But this is a Landsat photo. That's a satellite photograph of Antarctica. And what you should notice from this satellite photo is that there's very little surface area exposed. 98% of the continent is covered by glacial ice, the average thickness of which is 6,000 feet. So if you envision... North America like that, put a mile of ice over it, what are you going to have? You're going to have the mountains sticking up. And that's what we have in Antarctica. So even once we got there and started to look around, we only have 2% of the continent that tells us anything about its geologic history. Not very much at all. And most of it is right here along the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And this is where we work. And the areas that I'm going to show you tonight are down here in the southern Trans-Antarctic Mountains. Uh, about three or four hundred miles from the South Pole. Okay, um, to lead into this, um, for those of you that haven't seen my other shows, uh, how do we get there? Uh, LC-130s, uh, Air National Guard C-130s with skis, 
Uh, this, is a, this is a fairly dramatic picture given to me by the head of the National Guard unit because he didn't like the picture I had in one of my talks I gave on a play that I took. Uh, this shows a LC-130 and the Shackland Glacier. They land on the glaciers, no prepared runways, and if they can't get up enough speed because of the snow cover, they have what they call JATO takeoff, Genesis to takeoff. And you can see these are four torpedoes going off. They give them about 20 seconds of jet. <coughs> if they're going 55 miles an hour, they can get off, they can get enough off the ice to fly with this JATO takeoff. And you never, it, one of the worst experiences in my life is being in one of these planes when they did the JATO takeoff. I don't think the planes are designed to deal with it. But anyway. That's how we get to and from Antarctica, and that's how we get out into the field. Uh, they're pretty nice inside, though. Uh, this is uh, former student Nate Smith, who works with me in Antarctica. He's going back with me again next year. We're going to be on our, our eighth trip next year. And you can see he's in the back of the plane, and I'm up here in first class uh, in, in front of uh, the better seats right by the window. Uh, but this is what we go to and from Antarctica. Uh, when we go there, we go to New Zealand. From New Zealand, we go to, this is McMurdo Station, the, the research base established by the National Science Foundation in 1958. It's been there ever since. It's grown some. But this is the largest permanent uh, station supporting research in the Antarctic. And it's actually on an island off the continent. This is sea ice, and they land the planes on the sea ice. There are no runways anywhere in Antarctica. They wouldn't even if they tried to build one here in McMurdo, it wouldn't last. The, the cold and that w would break it up too soon. So they just they just land planes on the ice. We work uh, about 300, 400 miles from the South Pole, as I mentioned, about 500 miles south of McMurdo. And uh, our most productive areas uh, are along two glaciers. One's a Beardmore and one's a Shackland Glacier. Uh, both named by British explorers. Shackleton was a British explorer. Uh, Shackleton and Scott named the Beardmore Glacier for uh, one of their uh, sponsors from, from England who gave them a lot of money. Uh, this, is the, this is the glacier they used to use, the British used to use to try and get to and from the South Pole. Uh, and it's the glacier along which Scott, if you know the story about Amundsen getting there and Scott getting there after he did, Scott not making it back, uh, this is where they found it, uh, right at the base of this glacier. It's interesting to note, though, that when they found Scott in his tent, frozen with his colleagues, they were still manhauling sleds, and they still had geologic specimens. And among those geologic specimens were the first fossils from Antarctica. They weren't, they weren't animals, they were plants. But there are old Permian plants down near the base of this glacier that they had picked up some samples of it. So, uh, once we're in the field, we live in tent camps uh, like this, and we get to our sites. Uh, lately, the sites I've been working with the dinosaurs, we can't get to this way, but some of the older sites I'm going to talk about, we could get to some of these sites by snowmobile. Uh, base camp is on, on a glacier that's about six, between six and seven thousand feet in elevation. And we work uh, in areas, depending on where we are, uh, the older stuff, a thousand or two or fifteen hundred feet above that, all the way up to thirteen thousand feet. When we get to the areas at thirteen thousand feet, there's no way to snowmobile and climb that far from seven thousand feet, so we need helicopters. Which is what makes uh, what we're doing right now, because we're working uh, more recently, we've been working at high altitude, much harder to get funding uh, because of the logistic expense of, of having helicopters that far south and everything involved with that. But this is one of the newer helicopters. It's actually the same, uh, the same design helicopters they used in the Vietnam War. It's just a new version of it. It's, it's, a, the same, it's a, like a twin Huey, if you know what that is from Vietnam. It's made by Bell. All right. So if you've heard me talk before, um, this is for my students primarily because I don't know if there's anybody else here who's heard other talks I've given. Uh, uh, mostly lately I've been talking about dinosaurs up here. But I thought I'd say a little bit about the history of what I've done and the history of 
vertebrate paleontology in Antarctica. And in fact, what we have, you don't have to read all of this geology stuff. I'll just tell you what it means. We have a huge stack of rocks. These are sedimentary rocks. These are rocks deposited by an old ancient river system that changed course through time and a variety of things. But they date back to the beginning of the Triassic period, which is the beginning of the Mesozoic era. And that's about 250 million years ago. In the Transantarctics, the top of the stack of the rocks is early Jurassic, which is about 185 million years ago. All right? So we've got about 65 million years of sediment here deposited with some gaps in between. And so we have faunas of different ages. The very first Antarctic vertebrates that were found, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, are from the early part of the, the Triassic period. And this is 245 or 50 million years is before we had dinosaurs. The primary animals that dominated the ecosystem then were, uh, were a group of synaps, a group called the therapsids, which are a, a group consisting of two major subgroups, one of which was a plant eating group, one a meat eating group. Uh, their main claim to fame is the meat eaters were becoming more and more like mammals. And these are what we call the mammal-like reptiles that eventually mammals evolved from. And we have a lot of these faunas from all over the world, but you don't hear that much about them compared to dinosaurs because they weren't big and scary and they don't look good in movies. They get bad press. They were just kind of average-sized animals compared to what we have today. Odd, but average-sized. But these are the first vertebrates we found. And that dates back to before I got involved, and again, I'll say more about that in a minute. And then in the 1980s, we found a younger fauna from the middle Triassic. Now, now we're up to about 230 million years, 20 million years younger, still before we had dinosaurs. And we have different kinds of things. We still have these weird therapsids in there that are getting bigger. But we also have these giant amphibians, as I'm going to show you and talk about in a minute. A group of extinct amphibians that, if you saw them, you'd think it was a huge Nile crocodile or even bigger. Uh, but, um, very, very unusual animals. And then finally, in the 1990s, we found the dinosaur falls. Now, before I go on and talk about this, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you that we put a proposal when we've been trying to get funded, and, and it's gotten good reviews, and we finally got money to go back there next year. And our main thrust is to see what's going on in between. Because there are a lot of areas in between here. When we go to these places, we're going to places that people haven't looked at before. People haven't been because they're so remote. People ask me, well, Louis, what do, you, what do you tell people where you found that dinosaur? What if somebody wants to go there and infringe on your site? I said, let them try. They can't get there. Because the U.S. government and the U.S. Antarctic program is the only program that has the logistic ability to do this. And even though, and even... Even then, it's very, very expensive. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to work some more up here because we have more work to do. But I, 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 I've, I've broadened the team, and we've got a collaboration between three institutions now. We have a much bigger group. And we're actually going to try and cover the whole section up and down rather than concentrate on one part of it. OK, the very first vertebrate found in Antarctica was found in 1967 by Peter Barrett, and it was found right here in a place called Graphite Peak, pretty dismal, and it's a pretty crappy specimen. Um, little tiny fragment of amphibian jaw. There was no one down there. Geologists had been working consistently in the trans Mountains now at this time for about 10 years, ever since they established the Brittle Station. There's nobody down there looking for fossils, because vertebrate fossils are so rare any place that for the amount of money it would cost just to send up somebody down there on a whim that maybe they'd find something was not a proposal that would be funded. But Peter was a geologist from New Zealand, actually. And he was describing the section and the sediments, and he brought back a bunch of samples, and lo and behold, they found a piece of amphibian jaw, a very nondescript piece of amphibian jaw, but clearly the first fossil of a vertebrate from Antarctica. So what did that lead to? Well, that led to, okay, now we've got to have some expeditions down there to look for more. And here's a picture 
of the group that includes the first group of vertebrate paleontologists ever on an expedition to Antarctica from 1969. I am not in the picture. I was finishing my freshman year of college, so even though you think I'm old, I'm not that old. Uh, but I'll point some people out in this picture, at least one of them for some of, some of you who, uh, this will fall in deaf ears for some of you, but I think uh, for the president and dean at least, they might recognize Jim Collison who really was young at one time. He's on the board of, of the group, and he's uh, a geologist emeritus from Ohio State who worked in Antarctica for years before I got involved. Uh, the guy behind him is David Elliott, another good friend and colleague from Ohio State who the dinosaur happens to be named after, uh, that I met much later. And, and then this guy, Ned Colbert, was sort of the granddaddy of vertebrate paleontology of the time in, in North America and the world. He's, was, he was already retired from Columbia, and he was put in charge of leading the vertebrate group. And because of, of, of this guy and this guy in particular, I, I, I got my start in Antarctica, initially from this guy, and then I met him. But um, Ned was a real good friend of a guy who became my advisor and a colleague, and I got to know Ned before I ever got involved in this, and he kind of helped me along when I, I was a graduate student and, and got my first opportunity to go there. So the first expedition to Antarctica to look for vertebrates was 1969, there was another one in 1970. The next one wasn't until 1977, because between 1970 and 1977, these open field landings, they, were, they crashed three or four planes because they had some mechanical issues. So they canceled open field projects for a number of years until they fixed the planes. Well, meanwhile, 77 was when I was in graduate school, and that's when I got involved. And since then, I've been on seven expeditions looking for vertebrates. So there have only been nine in 40 years. That's not a lot, but that's because it's hard to get to, and the tenth one will be next year. All right, so enough history. But anyway... So what did these guys find? Um, one of the reasons funding continued for this <coughs> was in that 1969 year, they found an animal called Listersaurus. Really odd looking animal. Here, it's a, it, the initial animal they found is about the size of a medium sized dog. It's, it's a therapsid, which is a mammal-like reptile, but it's not in the group that led to mammals. <clears throat> it's kind of a weird herbivorous offshoot. It had this real steep face, had these two tusks, didn't have any teeth in the mouth, and kind of chopped up, had jaws that overlapped and chopped up its food. And the reason this was a find of significance was not just because we found, okay, we have reptiles from Antarctica, but back in 1970, this is when the theory of plate tectonics was just coming into its own and being solidified. And the geophysics behind what proves plate tectonics was, was there and, and playing itself out. But then they find this animal in Antarctica, and lo and behold, it's the exact same species as they find in Africa and India, which is exactly what the plate tectonics people might predict, because when they put the continents back together, these were one landings. So they didn't have to swim across an ocean to be there. So this, this had a big impact at the time. Uh, not just because it was a reptile from Antarctica, but because it was also a, a reptile that was really part of the proof for plate tectonics. So that's what led to uh, our expedition in, eventually in 77, 78. And we went to an area called the Cumulus Hills, and lo and behold, this is the area where last year some of my Ohio State colleagues proposed the name Mount Augustana for this mountain. Uh, we collected lots and lots of really good early Triassic stuff from this area. Not from the peak itself, but some of the first specimens of, of things that hadn't been found in Antarctica were found right along the flanks in this direction, this direction. And so this is our first camp in 1977-78. And I, that year that I actually, even though the top is in a good place to find fossils, yeah, I was a young pumpkin one day we were up here and we just climbed to the top of it because it was the highest peak in the area. So that's, um, that's Mount Augustana and the story behind it. Now, we found in that season, 
some very interesting things. This is that Lister source that I told you about. But look at this. This is the same, a different species, the same animal, just the front part of the skull. But look at the size of it. This is a huge species of a big tusk like this, about three or four times the size, called Lystrosaurus macaja. And so this was the first discovery of, of, of this large uh, animal in Antarctica. Uh, we found some other new weird things. This is a little lizard-like thing. Uh, most interestingly, besides Lystrosaurus, though, what we found, this thing called Thrinaxodon. And Thrinaxodon is, is a therapsid that is a small, weasel-sized carnivore that looks more like a mammal than a reptile. It's really a transitional animal between the reptiles and the mammals. And, and we haven't found any true mammals in anarchy yet, but we found some things that were... Mammals go back as far as dinosaurs. We're talking before the dinosaurs for this thing, and, you know, one dinosaur's coming to being, by then this thing has evolved into mammals too. But mammals... Uh, take a back seat to dinosaurs for many years for a number of reasons that are beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about tonight. But anyway, um, that's the early Triassic. Now, in, 19, in the middle 1980s, uh, by that time, my strategy was always at the end of the season to try and look around at different parts of the section that no one had looked at to try and find new localities because if we didn't have a good proven reason to go back, um, for the expense of it, it was it's it, it was always difficult to get funding anyway, but you always it was always good to have new finds. And so lo and behold, the 8586, uh, about uh, 1,500 feet above, you know, as we're going up the section of rocks, we're getting younger, because the younger ones have to be on top. We found this big platform here, and you were looking around this platform, it was like a big debris flow with big class of all kinds of things, and lo and behold, we find things like this in here. I think you can see the white bone, the outline of it, you may go, well, it's not, it doesn't show us very much here. But when we cut this out and prepared it, it looked like this. And it's a, an extinct amphibian, Protosuchus atemispondyl, and you, there's a scale there, but this skull is about this long. It's bigger than any modern crocodile. And more interestingly even than this one, this was, a, this was a, an animal known from other parts of the world, but we now found it in Antarctica. We found just the end of the skull, just this part, of one that was even a foot longer. I mean, this animal, and this is a new genus and species, and huge tusks. It, these things, you can't really see them, but these are... These are huge tusks running across the roof of the mouth that are two inches long. And gigantic teeth around the margin of the thing. And this clearly was something different than anything uh, found in any other parts of the world. Among the, amongst the largest, if not the largest, of this kind of amphibian known. So we gave it a new name. We named it after uh, my good friend and colleague Jim Collinson, Cryostate and Collinson. Uh, but this thing uh, was... Uh, a, a good 15 foot long amphibian. If you looked at it, this is a reconstruction of what it might look like. If you saw one, you'd think, oh, it looks like just a huge crocodile. Well, that, that's what these were. They, were. they looked like crocodiles, they acted like crocodiles, but they weren't crocodiles because they were amphibians. Crocodiles had not evolved yet. So they're more closely related to frogs and salamanders, but they acted more like. Uh, Crocodiles. And just in comparison, this is cryostega with the humans swimming along with them because they were semi-aquatic. Okay, along with uh, the big giant amphibians, and by the way, nobody pays any attention to the giant amphibians. That amphibian skull is bigger than the dinosaur skull. The amphibian isn't quite as long as the dinosaur, but that's a huge animal. But amphibians like the raps and stone instill the interest of the public, so it's not something that you hear about that much. But besides the uh, giant amphibians, we also had bigger versions of the therapsids. This is a huge relative Allistrosaurus. It's bigger than a modern bull, uh, and bigger than that, that biggest, bigger Allistrosaurus that we had, but related to it. 
And this is a, about the size of a wolf, a carnivorous uh, therapsid, and again, related to mammals. So we had these giant amphibians and bigger therapsids. Now what happens after this is when we get to the end of the Triassic, the therapsids get benched by the coach. And the archosaurs take the ball and run with it. The archosaurs are the group that includes the dinosaurs. And that's exactly what happens. This whole plethora of therapsids starts to fade away and disappear, and they're, they're not like Brett Favre where they make a comeback. <laughs> they're, they're, by the end of the Triassic, they're pretty much put out of business by the dinosaurs, the archosaurs. And so uh, when we get into the Jurassic, we find very, very, th these two first faunas, there were some connection between them and, and related animals. We get into the Jurassic, we find very, very different things. And this is a site where we found the dinosaur at 13,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and this is what the site looked like when we first came across it. There's a femur three feet long sticking out of the side of the rock. Lower jaw, the skull here. Uh, very much, we realized right away we, had, we didn't have therapsids anymore. We had to have dinosaurs because of the size of them. Uh, this is the distal end of the femur, the leg, the distal end would be in your knee. And this is even a much larger, heavier, more robust femur than that one we saw in the picture before. And so we had these, these much larger, massive bones. We knew we had the first dinosaurs from Antarctica. And so we were pretty excited about it. And so were the locals when they found out about it. <laughs> Especially when they found out and discovered their ancestors first. Uh, so they helped us assemble a crew to uh, excavate. This is a crew at the New Year's Eve party. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think this is the president and the dean. <laughs> and they're giving Paul Pearson a hard time. <laughs> Don't you think that looked like a meeting to the Augustan cabinet? I snuck in on it. Anyway. Uh, this, this is excavating at the dinosaur site now. Um, and this, we were there in the 90s, and we didn't get back until 2003. When we got back in 2003, we were still working. We found another site at Mount Kirkpatrick where we got some stuff. But the original site was just loaded with bones, and we hadn't finished it. So this is the original site we're still working. And you'll notice these are jackhammer drills. You'll notice they're drilling here. And our bone bed is going in here. And one of the problems I realized we had when we didn't finish the job in the 90s was we got progressively less out as we went back because there was more overburden. There was a bone bed, and the further back we worked, the more there was more rock. The further back we went, the more rock we had above the bone bed to remove to get down to the bone bed. So uh, when we planned this trip, um, and all three, we always have a big planning meeting. I have to go to Washington, D.C. for a couple days and meet with all the logistics people. And I, and, and I stayed an extra day because I, had, I made a request that they didn't like. And that was, I said, well, the way we need to get rid of that overburden is dynamite. And they were a little hesitant about using dynamite because it's at 13,000 feet, and helicopters are, don't like it that high anyway to take off and land or anything. It's, it's not really user friendly. And then we're going to be hauling dynamite. Today. Well, uh, we talked them into it. Um, I guess as long as they send the dynamite into the caps on different flights, it didn't matter too much. They wouldn't let anybody else go on the on the hill of the dynamite, which was fine with me. <laughs> but we had dynamite. We had a blaster. We had a lot of fun for three days. <laughs> and we went in there with shovels. And we uncovered so much stuff in 2003, we still didn't get it all. So that's one of the reasons we're going back next year, but not the only one, and not, not the primary one anymore, because we've almost finished the site. But anyway, uh, this, is the, this site produced the most complete skeleton of anything ever found in Antarctica. And that's this theropod dinosaur, Cryolophosaurus. This is the actual skull specimen. You can see, wow, if you want to see it, it's in the basement of Swenson. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. 
it, even if you're not a paleontologist. This is a lower jaw. This is the skull with this big crest on the head. And the only thing that's missing are the, is a tooth row. And that's not important because all the important stuff's in the back of the skull. This is actually the back edge of the skull and the knees are vertebra from the neck. So if we, if we sort all this out and put it back together, this is what it really looks like. And that's what you see if you look at the cast over in Swenson. You see this on top of the cast. It's very, very unique uh, because of the crest. Cryolophosaurus frozen crested reptile. Um, we named it that because it has a crest. Uh, we named it frozen because we froze to death taking it out of there at 13,000 feet at 2500 feet. You may say, well, if you're a real critic, you say, well, it wasn't cold when it lived there, was it? Or that cold? And I say, well, no. But we couldn't really name it anything else that, to me, that made a lot of sense. Antarctosaurus would be a great name, but somebody named 20 years ago shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed, but they allowed it. Named a big sauropod dinosaur from southern Argentina, Antarctosaurus. Because they said, oh, it's the furthest south dinosaur we're ever going to find. Well, they were wrong. So we have Antarctosaurus from Argentina. <laughs> so then maybe we would name it the Southern Crested Reptile. Well, what's Latin for Southern? Austral. Australia. So if we name it Australopithecus, 99% of the world who don't know Latin would think it was from Australia. So, we decided to get a little artsy color cryolophosaurus. Though, if you see the, if you see the term elvisaurus in print, I'll, I, I won't take responsibility for that even though I'm responsible for it. <laughs> I gave a talk at a meeting one time. First time I talked about this, it was a four-day conference. I always put the dinosaur talks at the end so everybody stays. Because you're tired of hearing talks. I was... Almost the last, I was fourth from the last talk, 40 conference. And I was talking about it. So, this is a display feature. It, it, it's a visual display feature. It's not used for anything else. It's like a peacock's feathers. And I use the analogy of it's like Elvis Presley's hair. Because, you know, it's loose floor, and Elvis Presley's hair was a display feature, too. And so, the next morning, the front page of USA Today. There's an article, and the headline on the article is Kingosaurus Rex Found in Antarctica. <laughs> and I've been living it down ever since. So, I don't give my fossils nicknames like Sue and some people, but this has a nickname that's grown out of my goofy joke from that meeting. Okay, this is uh, a reconstruction of it done by my friend Bill Stout, who in real life makes money by working for Disney and Spielberg and people like that, but Bill's taking a little liberty here and suggesting that maybe the females didn't have crests. We don't know that because we only have one. Uh, but anyway, we have enough of the skeleton now. We have 60% of the skeleton, the most complete skeleton from Antarctica that we were able to recreate very accurately that skeletal cast that you see in foil. And rather than show you a picture of that one, which you can go see after this talk, I'll show you a picture of a different mount of the same one. This is the newest skeletal cast of that made. This is at the National Science Museum in Tokyo. Um, there's another one at the, at the uh, in Brussels at the National Science Museum, and there's one in uh, New Zealand in Wellington and uh, Auckland, and one in Australia. And then there's one traveling around, and then the, there's the one we have. So there are a number of these casts around. There, you can go to a lot of museums and see just the skull cast, but uh, there are only about half a dozen of the skeleton casts. Uh, besides Scryolophosaurus, we find teeth from theropods of the meat-eating dinosaurs. And Scryolophosaurus died along a riverbank, and the bones are scattered around. The skull and jaw are still attached, parts of the tail are still attached, or articulated as you call it. But the main part of the body, the bones are moved around. It's been, it was scavenged after it died. And scavengers moved things around. And some of them broke off their little 
little scavenger teeth. And so we have some kind of little uh, celiophysoid. That's a group of, of small theropods that was around in the early Jurassic when this, when this was here. And, and Cryolophosaurus, for the kind of dinosaur it is, is very, very old. It's 190 to 200 million years old. And it's a distant relative of T-Rex. But it's about half the size of T-Rex. T-Rex lived 65 to 75 million years ago. This lived 190 to 200 million years ago. If you do the math, T-Rex lived a lot closer to right now than it did to when this dinosaur was around. And, and that's sometimes hard for, for people to comprehend that this is that much older. But anyway, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute here in closing. What else do we find? Uh, we found part of a, a, a primitive sauropod. The sauropods are long neck, long tail things. Uh, we call it a prosauropod because um, it, it's not real big yet. It's only 25 feet. It's not 70 to 100 feet. It's still not quite fully quadrupedal. Uh, the, the front arms are shorter than the back arms. Uh, but it's, it's becoming a sauropod. The sauropods, the big ones, are about 30, 40 million years after this. And I originally described this back in the 90s and called it a prosauropod and didn't give it a name. And Nate Smith, my, my former student here, who's at the University of Chicago now, has been working with me, met up with a guy in Argentina who had just revised primitive sauropods. And he said, can I take this and look at it? And show it to this guy. I said, yeah. And so he got a hold of me a month later. He said, well, I'm talking to Diego. And he says, it's a different... The foot's different enough, it's a new genus and species. And I said, well, go, you guys go ahead and write the paper, because I had another big paper I was working on at the time, I didn't have to do it. I said, you take, be, I'm trying to give them opportunities anyway. I said, you be lead author on this, Nate, and let him. So anyway, they named it after me, that's why it has that name. I, we don't name things after ourselves. But Nate and Diego named this, just last year. We originally described it about uh, 10 years ago or so, but they just renamed it last year. We also have a, a weird tooth from a, an animal called a tritylodon. Tritylodons were the last of the therapsids. Remember I said the therapsids gave rise to the mammals? The tritylodons, if you look at them, you'd say, God, it looks like a beaver. Well, it does. It's about the size of a beaver. It looks like a beaver. It probably acted like a beaver, but it wasn't a beaver yet. And so this was a beaver-like, mammal-like reptile. It was the last living representatives of mammals like reptiles before we get We already had mammals by this time. Mammals came from a different lineage, so they overlap. But we, we found evidence of this thing. And finally, the only thing we have yet to publish because it's really uh, given us a hard time is we have parts of a, a, a pterosaur. And it's incomplete enough that we're having some trouble figuring out what it's related to. But we, we describe it as being a pterosaur, but we haven't decided whether or not we can give it any name. So that's a current project we're working on now. Pterosaurs are the flying reptiles. They're not dinosaurs, but they're related to dinosaurs. Okay, so finally, I'd like to point out uh, Cryolophosaurus, as I mentioned, is weird because of its age, and it's weird because it's from Antarctica. It's also weird because of what it's related to. Because this is a whole group of very primitive meat-eating dinosaurs that typify the Triassic and early part of the Jurassic. This is a group of much more highly evolved theropods that we see come in late, late middle to middle to late Jurassic and end up in the Cretaceous with, at the end of this lineage, is T-Rex. Crylophosaurus is at the base of this group. It forms the most primitive member of this more advanced group. And it places the origin of this group back by about 25 or 30 million years. So it's really, really a, a unique animal for a number of reasons, not only because of where it's from and how strange it is, but because of where its phylogenetic position or where it falls in the family tree of dinosaurs. Okay, so finally, what's going on here? Do we have dinosaurs that love the cold? Is this a good depiction of Prylophosaurus in Antarctica? Um, probably not. Um, I don't think we had winters like this, even though Antarctica was at fairly high latitudes. Uh, one thing we have to look at is 
the fact that Antarctica, at this point in time, early Jurassic and earlier in the Triassic when these other things lived here, was not ice covered, it wasn't over the South Pole. It was part of this more giant landmass, Gondwana and Laurasia, all that makes up Pangaea. This is Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, South America. You may remember when I showed that Lister source picture, it showed Lister source being from here, here, and here, and that this connection was there. And this connection was still there in the Jurassic. We're still at fairly high latitudes for modern day climates. We're mu it, it, latitudes where Antarctica was here today would not be very pleasant. Um, higher latitude than we're at, uh, 65 degrees. Now the sites are at 85 degrees south. But we didn't have any ice caps and uh, climates generally didn't appear to be as seasonal and, and were milder. And, and there are some people that predict, well, it was still had to be real cold there in the winter. And so maybe these dinosaurs, maybe these things migrated. And it's possible. But I have a, the issue I have with that is you can migrate the dinosaurs all you want because they were very active and they were very social. But you take that giant 15-foot amphibian and that thing isn't migrating any place. Does not have the ability to leave or, 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 or the lifestyle to leave its watershed, its drainage, you know, the, whatever drainage system it's part of can go hundreds of miles. Uh, it can't live under those conditions and it wasn't designed to migrate. So I always look at the giant amphibian as being positive that things were not that extreme in terms of climate in Antarctica, more so than the dinosaurs. So, with that, uh, geologists like to use a sunset at their field site for the final picture, but if you want a sunset in Antarctica, you have to stay all winter. And so, I alternate my final slide between what I call the midnight sun, which is a beautiful picture of the sun as low as it gets in the sky, or this, which is what I call the darkest it ever gets in Antarctica. And the darkest it ever gets is when you're starting to get a whiteout. And this is the beginning of what is going to become a whiteout. Um, we were actually getting caught in this thing. We, we were traversing. We have all our stuff on our sleds and we're trying to get someplace. And you can see here you're losing off in the distance, you're losing the definition between the snow and the ice. You can still see this exposure here, but given another half an hour, you're not going to see anything. It's all going to just be like white. And these things are sometimes caused by wind and sometimes caused by fog. There are two reasons for a whiteout. But it's really eerie because if you're standing in the middle of a whiteout, you can be looking 10 feet away and, and you literally cannot tell where, <laughs> where the, the ice starts. And and the sky begins. So all you, at that point, all you do is stop and pitch your tents and start up the stove and wait it out. So, um, at any rate, um, that's what I have uh, for tonight. And I'd be glad to entertain any questions if you have them. Hope I didn't bore you with my nostalgic parts, but I figured this was the time to throw them in. Yeah, more. When, when you, and, you know, I'm used to this, what you do in that is this alien completely to the stuff that I would study. When you're out in the field like that and you came upon this, when did you know that you had found something different? Did it sort of bits and pieces and when you finally got back here and began to talk with people, or when that team was out there and you finally came upon this stuff, did you know quickly that this is different than anything? Well, when we found the dinosaur, we knew right away it was, it was different. We didn't, we didn't know at that point that it was a, a new genus and species or what kind it was, but it, we knew it was totally different than anything we had ever found in Antarctica, and we knew it had to be a dinosaur. So I guess at that point that was enough. And that was more of an immediate... Um, 
an immediate understanding of what we're looking at than some of the, a lot of the Triassic stuff that we're looking at. Because like that big amphibian, it was so buried and, and I could tell it was an amphibian, but I couldn't see as much of it and how big it was. And, but walking up to that three foot long femur, you immediately knew that it was something different. So it depends on what you're finding, but the realization comes in stages. And I remember years ago, and the first time I, I went to a meeting, and before we'd actually figured it out, I had that dinosaur skull with me. And John Ostrom, who was for years a prominent paleontologist at Yale, has since passed away, but he, he was old at the time. And I had the skull at the meeting, and we're, there's these informal sessions, and I hadn't talked about it yet, I was getting people's ideas. And saying what I said before we formed it, we didn't know it had a crest yet because we still hadn't finished prepping it out. But John, after the meetings, you have these informal things with posters and you're talking. And of course, they have a bar. And John was already in his 60s and he had a few drinks and he comes wandering over and he comes looking at it. And I said, Well, John, you know, I think it's a, a tetanurin and this is that advanced group of, you know. I said, But it's too old. And he's going, oh, are you sure about this? He said, where's it from? I said, Antarctica. And he's going, he's kind of looking at it. It was kind of funny because he shook his head. He said, why don't you just take it back? <laughs> <laughs> then we won't have to figure it out. <laughs> so just take it back. And I thought that was the funniest comment I ever got. About. <laughs> so just take it back. <clears throat> so, anyway. So you expect to find or are you actively seek out some Oh, we'd love to find Jurassic mammals. Actually, I have a lot of my colleagues who work on mammals who would love us to find Jurassic mammals. Particularly because then that would give them a chance that we probably have to invite one of them to come along with us. Right now, we don't have any mammal people in, as part of the group, but uh, we, we could. The problem with mammals in the Mesozoic is their they're, they're small and rather significant parts of the ecosystem. So they're not that common. You, you only find them in certain uh, unusual depositional environments. And, and we haven't come across those yet. I, I, I would imagine they're there. I don't see why they, they wouldn't be there. I, I can imagine there are a lot of other things that were there that we, we haven't found. But, um, we're, we're dealing with issues not only of not having as much to look at, but not having, but having so much to look at compared to the number of people we have to look at that we can't get to all the places we'd like to get. I mean, we've got, I don't know, I bet what we're, where we're going this year, we probably have enough exposure that if we went back for five to ten years, we still wouldn't get to looking at all of it. In terms of the amount of stuff that's there that nobody's looked at. So even though we're only 2% of the continent, it's enough area that nobody's been to that, I mean, uh, that's why, as long as we're diligent, we're likely to find something new. I mean, that's what's kept us going. Because, uh, you know, you know if, if it's it's not. One interesting thing, uh, since, since you brought this up, we have, we have the 250 million year old stuff in, in Younger that I talked about. There are a lot of sediments, there are a lot more sediments older back in the Paleozoic. And there are vertebrates around from the Paleozoic, other kinds of things. We have not found a single thing. And people have looked, I quit looking in the Permian, but. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm convinced it's a climate thing. Because in the Pens Pennsylvania and Permian, which just precede the Paleozoic, uh, we had times of southern glaciations. And I, I think it wasn't until we got into the Mesozoic that it was actually uh, mild enough climate for these things to get there. Because you look at the Permian of the other southern continents that are further north, and there's stuff there in Africa. And, in Indian places, but uh, not not in Antarctica. So it was a little too far south. Yeah, Darren. Yeah, 
it sounds like you just uh, run around and find new spots where you're going to find fossils. I know better than that. So how much of it is art? How much is science finding new good sites? As you said, you, you go around in the last few days or your last time there. I, I don't know if I'd call it art. I'd call it a combination of science and serendipity. That's what it is. I mean, you have to know the right kind of things to look for, but I mean, any place in the world that hasn't been looked at, you can go and there's the right kind of rocks there and you can look for weeks and not find any. I mean, there are guys working in the Antarctic Peninsula. There's some Cretaceous sediments there. And they're good friends of mine and I, I, I sympathize with them because they've been down there. They'll go down there for two months and one season they came home with one tooth. But it was a tooth and they were all excited about it. Another season they were there two months and they came home with one partial skeleton that you could fit in a cigar box. That's how little of it they had. And so it's, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta realize you're looking at river deposits. Animals die along the river, they get buried. You've got to bury those skeletons deep enough they're fossilized. And then they're still not real common. Then you've got to bring those rocks back to the surface and roll them out to the point where you have bones sticking out. And then you have to walk by and find them. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. So you can walk for days along the river and how many dead animals are you going to even see on the surface? So, you know, that's kind of what we're dealing with. Allison. Um, you mentioned that uh, some of the grasses were getting bigger uh, as you moved up through this. Yeah. Surface, and also, you've got these giant amphibians. Yeah. I know the dinosaurs aren't small, aren't big, but is there a significance to the, to the size increase there? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think with the therapsids, what we see for dicyna. The early Triassic dicynodonts generally aren't as big as the ones you get at the end of the Triassic. It, that's, a, that's a trend globally that the dicynodonts got bigger. And the same is true with some of the, some of the cynodonts, like Cynognathus, which is, you know, younger than Thrinaxodon in other parts of the world. Uh, the amphibians... Um, the amphibians are just weird. I, I don't know why. The amphibians that, that we collect here in the Middle Triassic are amongst the last of their kind, but they're amongst the biggest, and, and I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but again, there's a trend toward gigantic. And then their amphibians are put out of business by the crocodilians because they come in in the Triassic and are obviously more probably reproductively more efficient, if nothing else, so. Um, but. The interesting thing, though, that about the faunas, that some, some other higher latitude faunas from other parts of the world, uh, people have found things different about the animals that seem to indicate they were better adapted to higher latitudes. We don't have that. Some of the high latitude Australian dinosaurs, for example, from the Cretaceous, they, there's one they claim hibernated. There's another one they claim had really big optic lobes and could see better in the dark. Um, and they're using bone histology and skull shape, to, so maybe this is true, but uh, we can't even try and make things up about that kind of stuff with what we have. There's nothing that we see that's really different. So, I don't know. That's one of the things we throw in a proposal. Wow, we've got high latitude faunas and unlike other high latitude faunas, nothing <laughs> different. What's going on here? Maybe we better go back and try and find something that's different. <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to work all of the angles here to, about the possibilities and then as long as you end up with something you very often don't end up with what you predict you're going to find, but sometimes it's better.
So I think that's the case with the dinosaurs anyway. But, yeah, Ruben. I have a question about uh, snow cover and that um, with your dependence on having uh, uh, exposed rock to do your searches, have you noticed in the decades you've been there that there's been uh, a change in the total uh, snow-free area? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, uh, you know, the, the areas we're working in, the mountains, are above basal ice level. But it is interesting that uh, I have noticed differences in, in ice and snow cover at, on slopes. Because, you know, some places there, it's there and some places it's not. And perhaps most striking was when 77 and 78 when we were there uh, my first time. And um, that was a crazy season. We didn't have helicopters, but good thing I was in graduate school because we had to lug everything up and down, and big hundreds of pounds and backpacks. And we didn't care. I didn't care. I wouldn't do that again. Though. But anyway, I want helicopters. But anyway, uh, we went to these great areas, like where we found that big Lysterosaurus skull. Fantastic place, Shengping. And I never got back there again until 1995, almost 20 years later. And I went to Shank Peak, and there was, those exposures were like totally ice covered. I don't, I don't know why. It was a change in wind conditions or weather. I, I, you know, it was high above ice level, but there were these snow fields on the side, on these benches. You have, we have these exposures, and then you have benches, exposures, benches. And all of our nice benches were snow and ice covered, and you couldn't even hardly get at them. And so I don't know. That's where Mount. That's that was like within five miles of Mount Augustana when we found that big skull. I was thinking about your, your story with in the 1990s that you found that uh, we called it the, the debris field there, and it wasn't until 2002 that you got back. Were there any concern some site like that? Like no, those actually. Well, the dinosaur site was high enough altitude and steep enough. That I mean, when we went back there after eleven years, I, I left some. We left some chisels and stuff there because we we were trying to wedge something out with the jackhammers, and we had these things, the, these shivs stuck in place, and we had one or two more days, and then we got weathered out, and we couldn't get back up there and get some of our equipment. Eleven years later, you went up there. It looked like you left it yesterday. <laughs> You do that around here, it'd be all rusted, and I mean, we had a roll of toilet paper in a bag up there that was. Eh, looks okay. <laughs> we use the toilet paper to wrap the fossils. <laughs> we did well, you know. They, it's funny because at McBurdo, where we request our stuff, we always request way more toilet paper than it sounds like you would ever need for the usual function. <laughs> so I have to explain to them, well. You know, if depending on the size of it, if it's not very big and we get it out, we really wrap it well in toilet paper first, and then duct tape it, and then we wrap it again in heavier material and burlap. But you know that, so. 